special session for members of the bond group that will attend. Okay, today is the 7th of April 2009. We're at the uh, Buffalo Erie County Historic Society. Uh, my name is Wayne Clark and my assistant is Kathleen Matthews. Uh, sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? My name is Richard Dewar, uh, D-U-E-R-R, -R, and my uh, place of birth is North Tonawanda, New York. Okay, did you attend school? Yes, there? I attended the uh, St. Mark's Elementary School, Lutheran School, uh, grades 1 through 8 in North Tonawanda, and then I went to North Tonawanda High School. Uh, what year did you graduate? 1943. And uh, at that point, did you go on to college or did you enter the service? I entered the service. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted in Buffalo. No. Okay, and I see that you enlisted in the Army Air Corps. Yes. Any particular reason why? I had built models a lot when I was a child, and I was very interested in aviation, more of the uh, pilots of the day, Lindbergh, mm -hmm. Roscoe Turner, not personally, but I, I uh -huh. kept up with them, and uh, built a lot of model airplanes, and I, I just was very familiar with aviation, and mm -hmm. it's all I wanted to do. And, to be drafted, I probably would have ended up as a uh, uh, infantry somewhere, and mm -hmm. this way I had a chance to fly. So, had you ever been up in an airplane before? Yes, I had uh, a couple of times. I was up in a Piper Cub, mm -hmm. and I loved it, and uh, just became a part of my my love. I, I just liked to fly. I liked to be up there. All right. Um, so you went into the service July of 1943? Uh, yeah, I got out of high school in uh, June, and I was only 17, so I had to wait to go into active service. During that time, uh, they, they put us into the Civil Air Patrol, uh -huh. and, uh, <clears throat> and I didn't leave for active duty until November of 43. And whereabouts did they send you? Uh, to Miami. There were 37 of us, we were cadets at the Civil Air Patrol, and there were 37 of us that left Buffalo and sent to Miami Beach uh, for getting into some part of the service mm -hmm. of the Air Corps. What was that training like? Uh, well, it was difficult because I had never been away. I been out of the town, away from mm -hmm. home, and, and uh, the discipline, you know, not used to that. Uh, although I, I had a wonderful uh, childhood, mm -hmm. uh, everything, but uh, this was completely different. Uh, and it took a lot of getting used to it, uh -huh. but uh, uh, that could it very well. Now, how did you get down there? By train. By train? Through train, yeah. Okay. We left the Buffalo Terminal here as a group. Okay. Now, now down there at uh, Miami Beach, where did you stay? Were you in military barracks? or No, they had taken over all of the hotels, or many of the hotels in Miami Beach and had us uh, quartered in those mm -hmm. for four to a room. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once you completed your basic training, whereabouts did you go next? Well, the, uh, we were supposed to go into uh, flying service, but uh, they just didn't need a lot of flying personnel at that time, and uh, or pilots or navigators or bombardiers. Uh, so they sent a bunch of us on we were going to go to uh, mechanics and they sent us to Wichita Falls, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we did there was wait and wait and wait and uh, supposed to go to mechanic school, but uh, they never did. And uh, good by one, they just took us out of the barracks at Wichita Falls. We go to the Army barracks here. First real taste of Army life mm -hmm. in a barracks situation at an Army post, a real Army post. And uh, one by one, they just took us out. They, every morning, they, they so many people to go there, and then they never saw them again. Until finally, they were, we had about 250 people, uh, cadets in this barracks, and there were only two of us left one on the top floor, which was me, one on the bottom floor, which was another guy. So I got talking to him, and he was a well earned civilian life. 
probably after high school, I, I went to work as a welder at Vice at Shipbuilding mm -hmm. in Tonawanda. So I figured, well, I'm just going to go and be in a welding group for uh, uh, the Air Corps. And then finally he, he left, and I was all by myself for a couple of days at this barracks. Finally I went in and they gave, uh, gave me a big stack of tickets, and meal tickets, and train tickets, and sent me up to Las Vegas Army Air Force Base in Nevada, to gunnery school. And I was to be a, an aerial gunner. And as far as I know, I'm really the only guy out of the 37 of us that left Buffalo that got to fly at all. Hmm. I, I never heard of any of the others. I talked to quite a few of them later, and they ended up as uh, you know, cooks different places, or uh -huh. offices, and all kinds of other different jobs. But uh, as far as I know, I'm the only one that got to fly. Now, what was your training like in uh, Nevada? Uh, it was a lot of ground training, a lot of simulators, a lot of uh, online, learn the machine guns, 50 caliber machine mm -hmm. guns. And uh, I remember when they first took us in, they showed us the machine gun and said, you will learn how to take this apart completely with gloves on, blindfolded, and put it back together. I thought, this is absolutely impossible. You know, nobody could do that. It ended up we did. We, did. we had these uh, diamond gloves on that they put on, you know, so you could uh -huh. feel things. But uh, it got to the point where you could take it all apart, put it back together, and uh, we did a lot of ground training with uh, the machine guns on the range, and uh, uh, also to put us on trucks and then go around and have the uh, birds, uh, mm. play pigeons mm -hmm. flying over and shoot at those. And then came the aerial training, and uh, when we first went in to the school, uh, we walked under a wire. They said, don't stand up on your toes or anything, just walk under this wire. And I did. So automatically, they put me in the ball turret, because I was short. I was like uh -huh. five foot seven. So the tall guys couldn't do that. Uh -huh. And it was so crowded down there that uh, then eventually we got to do a lot of uh, aerial work. And I remember my first time in that turret, I was scared to death. Now, you, you were on a, was it a B-17? B-17 Flying Fortress. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful airplane, and uh, getting down into that turret was like going down into a little dungeon. Mm -hmm. and very cramped. Couldn't even wear a parachute down there. It was so cramped. Everything around the guns were right up here next to you, yeah. and uh, all the controls were in front. And had the sights in front. It was the gun sight was quite a fascinating thing. There were no computers back in those days or anything, but this was all automatic. You know, uh, a lot of training on the ground too was like aircraft identification, mm -hmm. and we had to learn the wingspans and uh, features of enemy aircraft. And uh, one of the things that you had to plug into the computer system on the site was the wingspan of the aircraft and the uh, altitude that you were flying at, and all different other data. And then as you, they, they, they had control the turret with uh, two, two sticks, uh, control sticks like that in a fighter plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, right, left, back, now. And as soon as you dropped down a little bit, you lost all contact with the airplane. You were all by yourself hanging in space, like you were in a balloon. And then you'd bring it up a little bit and you could see the whole bottom and the wings and the engines and, mm -hmm. and everything, but nothing up, up the top, of course. Uh, so. To tell where you were, it was a little clock next to you with the big hour hand on it. And everything was by uh, 12 o'clock was north, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, 3 o'clock was east and south and then west. And if somebody called out something, you know, fighters 3 o'clock low, uh, do exactly where you were, mm -hmm. and then you just they went over there and down and you found them. Because you couldn't see anything on the airplane, it's the only relation you had with anything. Mm -hmm. so, that worked out real good. And we did a lot of uh, gunnery work, and I loved that. Uh, we had a lot of air to air, where they had a, a plane towing a big sleeve, mm -hmm. a big white sleeve, and we'd fire at that. And uh, my sight was all automatic. We learned to fly, uh, to, to fire the guns on the ground, but they had the big ring sight like that, mm -hmm. and they all the reticles in there. Uh, different positions, you know, so you lead so much, or well, you didn't have to lead with this site at all. You just kept the uh, 
we had one reticle going up this way, one this way on a vertical plane, uh, for, uh, the horizontal plane, and another one coming down like this. And you could adjust with a foot pedal uh, how the reticles were this way. Mm -hmm. And you just use your controls to keep your horizontal line on the wings. Mm -hmm. And as the plane came in, uh, it got bigger and bigger and bigger in your sight. So you just uh, stretched out the reticles this way. And no matter where you were in the airplane or what your, the position of the plane coming in, it compensated for this. So you didn't have to lead them, you didn't have to do anything, you just keep that plane centered in this, mm -hmm. and you were shooting right at them. It was a fascinating thing. And then we did a lot of uh, air to ground work, and uh, that was fascinating too. If they had targets out there and you could blast away again, you could see the bullets going in. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I had never realized, especially after we got farther up to advanced training, was that they had tracers. When you uh, shot the there was a plume of smoke that came out from behind the bullet. The shell was about that long, big bullet. And uh, armor piercing, uh, incendiary tips on them. Very <laughs> deadly thing. And these plumes would show you where the bullets were going. Mm -hmm. However, one thing is the plane was out there quite a ways, as a fighter. Uh, as the bullet went out, it became lighter because it burned up all this power that was in there. So the bullet would drop. And actually, you were maybe shooting below where your actual target mm -hmm. was. Well, this gun sight compensated for that. So we didn't pay any, in fact, we ended up, we didn't use tracers anymore. We just shot because the, the site took care of everything. It's a beautiful thing. Hmm. And then when we got advanced training later, when we were flight training, uh, we did that down in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and, and they had these big rafts out in Tampa Bay. And they had big targets on them. And we come up to that. Of course, I had the best position in the whole airplane for that. Shred when I'm coming up to a side sitting right behind. Uh, I had the best spot in the, the whole plane for that. And you could see the, the bullets going across the water. Mm -hmm. Big plumes coming up, and then right into the target, and just blast them tore the thing apart. Fascinating. Okay. Uh, once you completed your gunnery training, uh, obviously you joined up with a crew? Well, I had a chance. I didn't have to go overseas. I, I did real good in gunnery school. Uh, and they wanted to send me to instructor school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, being a young kid, I was only 18 years old, uh, for patriotic duty, uh, all that type of thing, I just wanted to get into the action. And uh, so I refused to do it. I said, I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. And I could have stayed in Las Vegas, come back to Las Vegas as an instructor. But uh, when I was in Germany, I thought, why didn't I do that? <laughs> why did I select this? Because I would have been uh, assigned in Las Vegas, Class A pass, going to town whenever I wanted. Uh -huh. Would have been uh, my whole service life there. But uh, being young and mm -hmm. full of the vinegar and everything, I just wanted to get into it. So, uh, yeah, I, I got into it. They sent us to uh, Tampa, Florida, where we were assigned to crew. They, they set up the crews there, had no choice of the position. Mm -hmm. They just uh, told me to fall for it. <laughs> that's it. And that's most of 90% of my training uh, for a position in gunnery school was fall for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I ended up as a ball turret gun number 17. Now, the upper uh, ball turret, the, were the controls the same? Uh, they didn't, yeah, pretty much the same, uh -huh. uh, except. Uh, they didn't move, you know, you just sat there stationary and it just turned around. I see. And then the turret itself, the, the, the guns went straight up and down. But uh, mine, the whole turret moved. Okay. Up and then sideways, and you flew it like an airplane. All right. You flew the turret like an airplane, you know, whatever you wanted with it. Now, what, a lot of coordination. Once you uh, uh, met up with your crew, uh, you immediately started training. Um, were you doing gunnery training or just navigational or? Uh, mostly uh, gunnery training. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I spent most of my time as a, a gunner. Although I decided that they, they had a, another position too, 
they had bombardiers on the airplanes, and the bombardiers had the gun sights, the, the bomb sights, mm -hmm. and they dropped the bombs according to the sight, but it got to the point where they were doing so much saturation bombing that they had what they called toddlers that mm -hmm. eliminated the bombardier, and they took an enlisted man who ended up as a tech sergeant, and uh, he'd had, he went to training on the base there in uh, England, uh, and I did that, where you learned the whole bomb system, the controls, the bombs, uh, how to uh, take care of them, you know, when they were in the airplane and check them all out, and uh, how to sell them or drop individually, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And what you did that uh, had on the radio communication, when the to the, they tell you when you're on the bomb run, and then when uh, they went to open the bomb bay doors, so they had the controls to open the bomb bay doors, and uh, the pilot flew the airplane, but I had all the uh, controls for the, the bomb site. And uh, then when they said bombs away, I just hit the salvo button, mm -hmm. and down went the bombs. Well, I took my final exam the day that I got, I was to take it, the day I was shot down for Germany. Uh -huh. So I, my, probably my next missions after that, uh, that was on my 15th mission when I got shot down. And after that, uh, I probably flew four or a few more times as a ball turret gunner. Uh, and then from then on, I would have been a toddler up front in the mm -hmm. bomb position. Okay, let's, uh, let's go from, uh, you met up with your crew, you trained, and then at, at what point did they send you overseas? Uh, we trained until, well, we trained in Tampa. Uh huh. Uh, for about four or five months, about five months, and it was in September of '44 that they they had a hurricane down in Florida, mm -hmm. and they had a, a manufacturing base in Georgia. So to get the planes out of there, we were ready to go, ready ready to go. We had graduated, and everything was great, and they sent us into Georgia and picked up a brand new B-17 to get it out of the hurricane area. And we flew it up to uh, Indiana. And uh, stayed there for about a week while well, the weather all cleared. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> then we flew it to Bangor, Maine. And I, I remember we flew back along the East Coast. And uh, I suggested to the crew, why don't we go watch like, look at Bangor Falls? And so that was a great idea. So we came up around that way, and I said, let's just follow the Niagara River. And I guided them most down and turned the guy, and I'll turn a little bit to the left, a little bit to the left, drop it down as far as I can, and flew right over my house in North Carolina. Wow. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to go around and do it again, and pilot said, hey, we're not even supposed to be here. <laughs> so <laughs> that was it, but that was, and just as I got near the house, the cloud cover came in, and I, I never did see the house, but I knew everything up to it. Uh -huh. was quite an exciting thing for me, too. Sure. Now, uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I take it you flew the plane overseas. Yes, we flew it overseas uh, from Bangor, Maine, yeah. and we landed in Iceland. And we were about 45 minutes overdue in Iceland. And boy, that got to be kind of scary. Mm -hmm. The bomb bays had huge tanks in them, not bombs, but huge tanks full of fuel. And we were starting to worry, you know, that uh, I hope our navigator knows what they're doing here. And, uh, <laughs> well, finally we got in there because you had radio silence. So you yeah. couldn't get on the radios because the Germans were in the area. Uh, so we did get in. We landed. And, oh man, I, I didn't like it there at all. I stayed for two days. Uh -huh. Damp and cold and, and mud. And, oh, that was terrible. Now, what, now once you took off from Iceland, whereabouts did you? Uh, we landed in Scotland, and I stayed there for about a week. Mm -hmm. Well, they reassigned us to uh, a bomb group. And I got, so we got assigned to the 303rd bomb group, and uh, you didn't keep the plane you flew over with. No, you? no, we thought we were going to, so we were so careful with it. Mm -hmm. But no, they took that away from us right away. <laughs> and uh, we landed, we landed to the place uh, near Bedford, England. Molesworth was the name of it, Molesworth, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Got a sign that it was the Hell's Angels group. And uh, 
right away, you know, the whole story about the group when we first got assigned. This group had been wiped out completely a couple of times, and wow, what are we getting into here? <laughs> but uh, we got there, and we started uh, training in England. Uh, first time we had heated flying suits. In the States here, we trained with the heavy sheepskin equipment. Mm -hmm. But we got over there, we were issued these heavy, these electrically heated flying suits, and they were fantastic. Remember one time we were flying, it got down to 67 degrees below zero. Oh my goodness. Cold. And if you took your heavy flying, everything was plugged in, flying gloves over uh, nylon gloves. Mm -hmm. And if you took your hand out of the flying glove, in about one minute you lost your fingers. They were just completely frostbitten and you lost the feet. You had to be very careful. But it was warm. And my control on my heat control uh, on my flying suit, everything plugged in. The pants and the jacket and everything plugged mm -hmm. in with gloves. And booties that you put on your feet inside your uh, uh, flying uh, boots. Uh, very, very nice. <coughs> and my control was underneath the seat, which I couldn't even see mm -hmm. down there. So I always set it for low before takeoff, and then as we got good higher and higher, it got be colder and colder and colder. And I just had to put the, poke the thing with my finger and get at least heat, 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 heat mm -hmm. <laughs> the way up there until it was comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I was never uncomfortable in that uh, position. And a lot of people hate it that they refuse to fly it. Uh, because if, if you had any sense of claustrophobia whatsoever, you couldn't do it. Yeah. But I loved it. I thought it was great. Uh, up above, they had to wear heavy flight jackets and helmets and all that to keep the flak away, but I couldn't have room down there for any of that. But the whole thing was like a was armor or a plate on it, mm -hmm. and, you know, real thin, but enough so that it uh, was just as effective as a flak suit up top. Now, what was your first mission like? Uh, it wasn't bad. It was pretty much of a milk run. And, well, we, we did a lot of training missions ahead of time, too. Okay. Uh, testing everything out, and uh, uh, the first mission wasn't bad at all. I thought, well, you know, this is going to be a piece of cake. Whereabouts did you go to? I don't remember the first one. But then after that, we ran into, uh, we didn't meet so much fighters. Every two in a while, fighters would come in at us, German fighters, but we had fighter protection all the way to the targets and back. And, uh, but not on the bomb run because the German fighters didn't want to get blown up either, mm -hmm. or the American ones. So we, when we got on the bottom one, which lasted quite a while, we were unprotected, and then the flak was heavy. And uh, most of the planes got shot down with the flak. And at the early part of the war, they didn't have many flak factories like that. But toward the end part, or the middle of the war, when I was in, they had them covered very, very heavily. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, very intense, so we lost a lot of it, and that was the scary part, because you could see these big, huge puffs of smoke out there, uh, like a big explosion in the sky, and they'd be way out in the distance, and they'd get closer and closer, until they got pretty much zeroed in, mm -hmm. and then they'd be around you, and sometimes they'd be so close, you could see all fire, you could see in the middle of it, and the, uh, the, the, the concussion would get push the airplane around. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting peppered. You could hear the, the shrapnel from the deck, from the, uh, the shells going through the, the airplane. Mm -hmm. And uh, you come back and you end up start coming the holes in the airplane, which you got back. And finally get up to 100 and something, you just forget about it. Now, did you uh, <coughs> have any of the flag come through your plexiglass? Yeah. Uh, I had a, a series of windows along the side here. Mm -hmm. And a couple times pieces came through that and hit me. But uh, there was uh, one piece that came through and it was bouncing around inside my turret. And that, uh, that was kind of scary. But it didn't hit me either. So. Okay. But, uh, yeah, but it tore the airplane up. Now, how long was uh, a, a typical or average mission? It depended on how, where you went. Uh, they landed anywhere from about uh, Oh, four or five hours up to maybe eight or ten. Mm -hmm. And you flew it at high altitude? High altitude, yeah. Always? For most of the time? Well, coming back down, you were you're coming down. It took a long time to get up to altitude because we were heavy, mm -hmm. heavy loaded, fuel and bombs. 
and it took a long time to get over the channel. And once we got over the channel, we were up to uh, over 10,000 feet, and we had to go on oxygen. Where with the mass, they were not pressurized cabins or anything. Mm -hmm. so you had to wear the oxygen. And you had a little gauges in the, the, the turret where I was too. Uh, one was like a big eye that blinked like that, and it showed every time you took a breath. And the other one was a pressure gauge. So you put your pressure, the oxygen was, so you knew that you were getting it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went on to oxygen at about 10,000 feet. And then we came back and went off oxygen at about 12, 13,000 as we were coming down. Okay. Now when you went on the mission, you, you took off, at what point did you go down into the ball turret? Uh, over the channel. Over the channel? Yeah, over right the channel. Yeah. Now, uh, were you able to eat it all down there? Or? No. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Um, could you smoke down there? or No. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. not nothing. No. No. Okay. Um, no bathroom. <laughs> you, you didn't have a relief tube? or? Yeah, a relief tube up in Europe and it was in the bomb bay. Oh, but there was nothing down there? No. Okay. All right. And. Uh, but we were young. I was only 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had a lot of capacity at that time, too. I could go for eight hours without. Uh huh. Okay. All right. And uh, you went on 15 missions? I got shot down on my 15th. Uh, they had. Quite a few ball turret gunners dropped down because they just couldn't take it anymore. They just mm -hmm. couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Uh, being down there all by yourself uh, never bothered me one bit. Never bothered me at all. I never had a problem with that. Uh, but the, the one mission, our 15th mission, my crew was not to fly that day. And I was supposed to take my final exam for Tiger Lear, too. Mm -hmm. they? But they came and said, uh, well, the ball turret gunner on another plane had just Suddenly quit, just went bananas. He said they couldn't do it, so they grabbed me and I flew in his place. Oh, so you didn't? You weren't even with your regular no, crew? No, no, I was flew with another crew. A couple of times that happened uh, during the course of the flying. Okay, let me just go back a little bit. Uh, did uh, did you normally fly on the same airplane most of the time? A lot. We had our own airplane assigned to us finally. Did it, did it have a name to it? Yeah, we called it the Sweet LaRonda. Uh, the pilot's wife's name was LaRonda. Mm -hmm. And while we were training as a crew down in Tampa, Florida, uh, the wives of the people, the crew members that were married, that was the uh, bombardier and the, uh, the pilot. And the uh, flight engineer. Mm -hmm. Their wives came down and stayed with them in, in hotels in, the, in Tampa itself. And uh, we got to know her real well. She was a wonderful person, uh, real friendly with the group, and became like a mother to us almost. You know, I'm only 18 years old. You know, so. Uh, so when we decided to name the airplane, we got our own name, whatever we wanted. And uh, so we said, well, how about the Loranda? So we named it the Sweet Loranda. Mm -hmm. Was there? It, uh, Nose art on, which was a very popular thing at that time. And it was a red-headed girl uh -huh. in a, a bathing suit uh, with red hair flowing behind riding a surfboard. Uh -huh. so, well, she was a redhead. So uh -huh. that was her riding the surfboard, Sweet Laurent. Now, was your jacket decorated at all? Not the one I had over Well, I lost everything anyway, but, yeah. you know, uh, but I have a jacket now. That, uh, that had pictures of all this stuff. Uh -huh. And I had one with the, the airplane with all the markings of the group and the names Sweet Laranda on it. And I had photos of all this stuff. So oh, okay. I had a jacket like that, yeah. All right. Um, so do you want to tell us about what happened when you, you were shot down? What, what transpired? Well, our target was Cologne, Germany. And uh, it was a bad day. It was a 300th mission of the group. And it was a, a terrible day, uh, weather-wise. And only a few few planes from our group got off the ground. We were deputy lead that day, so we were one of the first. And after a few, the, the plane was skidding around on a runway, fully laden plane with bombs and fuel, very, very dangerous. So they scrubbed the mission. But 
we were already airborne. Mm -hmm. So they assigned us to another group, had us go to another group and fly with them. So we, we flew with that group. Uh, and our group that, that day stayed on the ground. My crew, every, the whole rest of the group stayed on the ground. Uh, some of the planes got off, but not very many. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we flew, and our target was supposed to be Bonn, Germany. But uh, the weather there was really bad. So they trans transferred us to an older target, which was uh, Cologne. And, we, and that was heavily defended, very heavily defended. And uh, we went in at about 25,000 feet that day, which was the lower you got, the more dangerous it became, because they could zero in on you better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went in, and uh, we got hit bad, right on the bomber. At, at 25,000 feet yeah. from flat. Yeah. And it uh, knocked out an engine. Our, our left engine got knocked out. And then our number two engine got hit. I was down in the turret at the time, too, and I saw the number two, and it just like, exploded. Mm -hmm. And I'm right next to the thing, like that. And then it started burning, and the flames were coming over the wing and shooting by my turret. You know, and I thought, wow, this is pretty bad here. You know? And I told the pilot, yeah, if you land this airplane, <laughs> You're not going to do too good because the wheel's gone. The wheels and the tires and everything are all burned up. But he was having such a hard time controlling the airplane that uh, he said, I don't think we have to worry about that. And uh, we got farther in and, and we got hit so bad that all our actual flight instruments were knocked out. Now, you, you were still carrying your bomb load at that? Yeah, and then they jettisoned the bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, we couldn't even hold the airplane steady anymore. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't even stay with the formation. We just wanted well, we all over the place. We hit so bad. And then our number two or three engine went out. So we were down to one engine. And then the, uh, the number two was on fire. Number one was knocked out. Number three was windmilling. And mm -hmm. that's when, uh, when they stopped an engine, they turned the blades into the air. Otherwise, the wind would make the engine turn. Well, that part of the engine got damaged. So the thing was just windmilling. Well, this ends up like a big board in front of the airplane. And it just moves the aerodynamics of the airplane. So it was extremely difficult to control. Mm -hmm. So we were fluttering our way back, actually. And we got far back to uh, Belgium. And uh, Now, were you still on the turret, or did they no, pull you No, I had to come up because they got the uh, yeah. power out. And my turret was electro-hydraulic control. So when the power went out, I couldn't do anything with the turret anymore. Mm -hmm. It was gone. I had no, no control over the turret. My guns were operated electronically, or electrically, uh, with the triggers on top of the control sticks. Mm -hmm. It was a button, you know, like in a fighter plane. And uh, that wouldn't work, so I couldn't do anything down there anyway. So I had a couple of cranks for emergency that you plug into a socket and turn it one, one, one way and it turned the plane on a horizontal plane. The other put a, put a delta crank in another socket. And that turned it so that you could go up and down vertically. And you could get back down to, to bring the turret uh, up toward, toward the back. And then, because the, the door, the turret was up in the back. Mm -hmm. And the only way you could get up to the airplane was to have the door, you're, you're looking straight down at the ground, and the door above you, and it opened up into the airplane. So you had to climb up through that thing. And my parachute was up there anyway. Mm -hmm. I couldn't carry my parachute down there because I had no room for it. I right. just had room for me. So I got back up, and the plane was full of smoke, and the fire was shooting out the side. And the, then the, the bailout sounds uh, went off, and the navigator had come back to the back of the plane where we were, and he said that he didn't know exactly where we were because all the spiders were gone, compasses, everything. So he said, we're over friendly territory, so you got no problem. So. Uh, we got down 20,000 feet and said, hey, we're going to blow up. You know, it's, it's just a matter of time, minutes. So uh, out we went. And uh, I went out, and as I went out, I remember I, I tumbled. Did you have any apprehension at all about jumping out? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I never had jumped before in my life. Didn't even train to jump. Uh -huh. And uh, absolutely. But got up to the door there, and I thought, well, if I stay here, I'm going to fry. And if I go out, I got a chance. So mm -hmm. I just dove out. I dove out because the elevator, the airplane, the airplane was right up in the back there. So I dove out to get underneath that and then down and hit the slipstream. And I just tumbled like that 
up and down and tore my tail helmet off. And uh, I pulled the shoot cord after a while, after I got straightened out and I got so I was falling with my chest up. And uh, I pulled the shoot and something happened. Oh my God, panic, you know. I looked down and there they had a big red G ring on the chute. And I looked down and it was still there. I ripped my flying glove off and I grabbed it. My glove had slipped off of it. Heavy glass flying glove. And I pulled it and that pilot chute popped out. And it went up like that. And I thought I broke myself in half. Because when I was down in the turret, they had these flying harness on, mm -hmm. the chute harness, you know, that was strapped all in and everything. And you could hook the chute up in front of it. And when I was down there, I was cramped up. It was very cramped down there. So I had it loose, because so I, I wouldn't get bound, bound up, you know, because you were all cramped. And when I got up, I was in such a hurry, I forgot to tighten it. So when I put the chute on and then went out, it was loose. And when that thing was let go, it whoo, and it like split me in two almost. I thought it knocked all the wind out of me. Couldn't breathe. I thought, oh my gosh. And then, strangely, it came down, it came down and, and it was huge. And then it was, I loved it. I, I thought that was, boy, that great for friendly territory and uh, coming down. It's like in a balloon. No sensation of falling, nothing, just floating around. And, and, and I thought, this is great. You know, I, I love this. I thought, do some more parachuting uh, after I get out of this. But then we came down and I landed in trees. It was a forest, landed down in a forest, the woods. We didn't have stirable. Uh -huh. at that time, it was just a plane down. And I tried to turn it so I could face into the wind, and I started pulling on it like this, and the whole thing started to collapse. And I thought, if I keep this up, I'm going to fall straight into the chute, so enough of that. And then I just came down and jerked it around little by little until I was like quartering into it. And I hit the trees, and it was winter time, and the leaves on the trees, and I came crashing down through that. It's the last I remember. Yeah, until I was on the ground. And, oh, I was out for a while. Oh, you were knocked unconscious? Yeah. And uh, it was a horrible headache. And I got a, a big scar, dent in my head from up here down mm -hmm. to here. It's about oh, three, three and a half inches long. You feel with your foot. So you like split it. your head open on yeah. that? Yeah, not the skin, but the, the, the thing was split open and mm -hmm. uh, you could feel it. And, uh, <coughs> I could barely walk. And I met up with the uh, waste car, and he landed not too far away from me. And uh, we walked down a road. It was uh, we landed on a big like hill coming up, with a road on the side of the hill. And we got on this this road, and we were walking along it, figured we're in friendly territory. He came up to what was an intersection up there, and I saw a lot of tanks and soldiers. I'm thinking about man, we're right in the good middle of it now. Actually, we had landed right on top of the Battle of the Falls. Oh my God. Uh, near Neuf Chateau in Florinville, Belgium. Uh, right, the Germans were retreating, and uh, of course they spotted us, but we went into the woods that were around there. But uh, they came after us and we had a chance. And uh, so they grabbed us. And I spent a couple of days with them, and I, I could barely stand. It was so bad. And then they ended up, uh, there was a German hospital near there. Uh, this they put me into this German hospital, and uh, no medical attention at all for us. And it was on the third floor. I remember, wooden floor had straw on the floor. It was cold, and laid on the floor. And a German doctor finally came in, and he looked at me. He says, "Well, we have a fractured skull. We don't have X-ray equipment. I can't tell how serious it is. We have no medication, no pain relievers. We don't have anything." They were using paper for bandages for their own people, mm. creep paper for bandages. And uh, he said, you'll live. That was a, never saw me. That was the total amount of medical treatment. But uh, it, I still have the effects of that today. Mm -hmm. I got uh, uh, a migraine, optical migraine out of it, and a lot of other stuff going on. It's just uh, eyesight problems. Now, you went into the hospital. What about... Uh the fellow that was with you, did he? He was not hurt. He was okay. I never saw him again. So he went on to a POW camp, evidently? Yeah. Well, then I did too. After I got out of that, I entered a POW stream and gradually got into Germany farther, trucks and trains. and uh, That was quite a trick too. We were under guard all the time. And a few of us were got as far as uh, 
Cologne, Germany, we're going through Cologne. That was one of the worst experiences I've had of the entire war. Because, you know, when you're flying up there, you're all by yourself. You're in your own little world. Uh, you come home from a nice warm bed, nice meal. Uh, you have a couple of shots of whiskey that they gave you when you got down to settle your nerves. Uh, and then the next day, a couple of days later, you flew again. Mm -hmm. So you didn't really get the impact of suffering in the war or anything like that. But going through this town, you could see the buildings were shattered. The big buildings that were half blown apart. And rooms wide open with uh, covers of different walls up there that were just mm -hmm. hanging. Uh, bathroom fixtures like tubs, sinks, just hanging by the plumbing out the side of the building, on the side of the building, just dangling there. And uh, we were walking through, and there were people around, uh, civilians, watching us, the guards around. And this uh, elderly woman, black, uh, real, real old, she came up to me, and she started hitting me, pounding on me, calling me a murderer, and uh, uh, look what you do, look what this did, and look at my granddaughter. And she had a big patch over her eye, the granddaughter. And she said, you did this. You did this. This is your fault. And uh, the, the guards grabbed her because they were protecting me now mm -hmm. from, from her and from the population and the other guys that were with me. And uh, I never forgot that. I could never get over that. I had nightmares about that for years. And I wake up at night, that, that vision would appear in my head. Mm -hmm. And I could still remember it. It was just uh, the worst part. I, I never recovered really from that. Now, you were, you were still in your, your flight yeah. uniform? Yeah. Your flying suit? Yeah. 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 So they knew who I was, what I was. They had you know, a helmet on, goggles, and all that stuff. So they knew that I flew. Mm -hmm. So they knew that I was one of the ones that came down and dropped the bombs on them. And that was the first realization that I'd had of what the horrors of war really were. Mm -hmm. And it was what it was doing to the people. Because I, you know, I never saw any pilot or a plane that I had shot at, hit the pilot, uh, probably. Uh, never saw one really go down because it was so busy, you know, you just shoot and on to the next one, they'd come in, mm -hmm. not just one behind the other. And, uh, but this was the first that I'd seen of something like that. Mm -hmm. And what had happened, and the first realization that I had that this doesn't affect just the battlefield, the people, it affects all these people, millions of people that have got these bombs and had suffered through this. Like, oh my gosh, war is hell. So that, uh, that was a bad part of it. So they marched you on to a, a Yeah, we ended up, like, we camp. ended up for uh, a week on a, what we call them, the 40 and 8. These car cars, the trade cars that took uh, 40 troops or eight horses, that's called mm -hmm. the 40 and 8. And they packed us a whole bunch in there so we couldn't even have room to sit down. Just pack us in there, in there for a week. No sanitary facilities, no food. Oh, it was a, quite a trip, mm -hmm. quite a trip. Uh, go to the bathroom, you had to walk, try to crawl to the side of the car so you could you know, use, it, use it there and not mess everything up. And people would step on you, you know, sleeping, trying to sleep. Of course, I was kind of curled up because I couldn't sleep with my head. And uh, I used my helmet and earphone as a pillow. Mm -hmm. It was not very comfortable, and uh, that was a bad time, a really bad time. And once you got to the prisoner of war camp, what, what was the name of the camp? Uh, well, we went there several. Uh, one was called Wetzler, which uh, they made cameras there. The German like a camera, mm -hmm. they made that there. And uh, it was like a, a transfer camp. They had prisoners coming in from all different places. Well, before I got there, uh, I got interrogated. And boy, they beat the crap out of me. Head in bed and everything, and knocked me down, and then kicked me, and uh, got me back up again, and then hit me again, and asked me questions. What was your bomb move? Uh, what was your mission? Where did you go? And I told them, I didn't go to mission that morning to briefing, which I did, I had to go. Yeah. But uh, I told them I didn't know. I didn't know what the mission was. I said, somewhere in Germany. Uh, what was the name of uh, your group? And I gave him a false name. I didn't tell him it was a 303 Bob group. I just picked the name, I number one out there. And uh, it was so, they didn't have enough information at that point there to verify anything mm -hmm. I had, so they just kept writing everything down. 
And uh, finally, uh, I could hardly even talk anymore. You know, just break passing out half the time. And uh, then they, they took me out of the room. It was on a, like the second floor. Got on the landing. They kicked me down the stairs. I just went flying down the stairs. Oh man, I got I couldn't even get up. Uh, had an awful time. And they put me in a room along with a lot of other prisoners. And got in this this room and I fell asleep, or probably passed out than anything. Woke up the next morning when they got us up, and uh, it was in the evening. Uh, they had to take us out and march us somewhere outside of where that area was. And uh, they said, "Stay with the group. Go straggle. You'll be shot." No way could I stay with the group. I could hardly even stand. And there were two British soldiers, airmen. Came up. They had been shot down, probably, in a fighter. And one grabbed me on one side, and the other, and the other. And they lifted me up and put their arm around me. And said, "Hang on, Yanks. We'll take care of you." And they walked me through the entire time that evening until finally we got to a field where they just put us down and said, "Sleep." The next morning, I got up and I looked for them. I couldn't find them. They were gone. Mm -hmm. I never even got to thank them. But they saved my life. You know, mm -hmm. I, I never want to survive that. That was a terrible experience story. So eventually, as you get back, all these things come back and haunt you. You know, mm -hmm. you think about these things, you wake up in the middle of the night and uh, dream that you're in a, in a dark part of the moon or something, you know. They call it, I guess, what, post-traumatic stress. stress. Yeah, I had a lot of that. Then I had a lot of medical problems. I've had four heart attacks, uh, heart valve replacements, uh, stroke. And it all caused my blood pressure. Blood pressure just went skyrocketing after I got back. And uh, uh, it, well, it was about some time after. It didn't happen all at once because after I got back from Europe, uh, I ended up in Atlantic City for reassignment. And they looked at my record and said, well, you passed everything for flight training. Do uh, you want to be a pilot? I said, yeah, that'd be great. And uh, even though I, I you know, couldn't hardly see too good anymore, I, but they said, yeah, we'd send you to a flying school. And uh, they then said, well, you stay in, uh, you got to stay in for about 18 months to go to a flight school. And you got to sign up for about three or four years after that to stay in, because we're not going to spend all this money to commission sure. you as a pilot and all that stuff, and then you, they'll let you go. I said, well, no, I don't, don't want to do that. So they told me to go someplace else. I said, well, how about radio school? So they ended up there. Okay, so you were a POW. How long were you in a POW camp for? Oh, six months. It's near the end. Okay. But that was and a bad time. You were out of food. Uh, I lost 50 pounds. I went down to 150 pounds, and I was about 98 when I got liberated. Uh, my fingertips were all black. I, you know, when you stand up, you had to hang on to something because you just mm -hmm. went around. I did anyway. Now, did you uh, have the first aid packages or strictly? The uh, German food. Uh, we got in prison camp. We, we didn't. German food was uh, like soup, but there was I mean, hardly anything. It was little potatoes. You maybe got a potato a day and a chunk of black bread. And this, this black bread, they had date stamped on it, year, <laughs> year that it was made. And it was like, I understand it was something like twenty eight percent sawdust. Mm. Oh, terrible, <coughs> but it was something to put in your stomach. All right, and, and the uh, soup was just broth, like they, they cooked potatoes for their troops, mm -hmm. and they'd give us the water the potato was cooked in. Any meat at all, or vegetables? Very little, very little of any of that. And they had something they called coffee, but it wasn't coffee, it was, they called it airsots. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what it was, uh, big wheat or something, I guess, and oil or anything. So they got that once in a while. Now, did uh, they f force you to work at all? No. No, that uh, was against the Geneva Convention. <coughs> and while we were in, in our trip, I spent a lot of time traveling through Germany under guard. And we stopped for a day at uh, some labor camp uh, near a train station, a train terminal, and went in there. <coughs> and they had a lot of DPs in there from Poland and Hungary and places like that. Mm -hmm. And all those people, they were gaunt, they were haggard, and they didn't have any beds or anything. They had 
these cubicles built up the side of the walls. <coughs> and they had to climb up on the like, ladder. You go into this, climb into this cubicle, it's just big enough to crawl into it. And then that's where they slept. And uh, we talked to some of them, and uh, they were in terrible shape. And they would take them out to repair their railroad yards, because mm -hmm. they'd get bombed and blown up, and then they'd take them out. And they said that <coughs> and some of the prisoners had gotten real weak. They would take a pail of water, throw it up, turn them into an icicle. A day or two later, the guy was dead. That was terrible. Now, when you were liberated, were you liberated by the Americans? Or? Yeah. George Patton with his third army came through. Mm -hmm. And he liberated the camp. And, you know, the first item was that Germans were running. But this time we had gone down to Mooseburg. It took two weeks to get there. Uh, marching. The whole group, long screens, and then sleep in the fields at night. Uh, hardly anything to eat. Oh, what a trip. Very cold, wintertime, very cold. And uh, a lot of people died, a lot of prisoners died. And uh, so we went into this North Bornburg where they just had tents. They didn't have any buildings. They didn't built for about 2,000 people originally, and they had something like 10,000 there that they had funneled into Germany. Jared Hitler was going to use this for a bargaining chip. In fact, he actually had to said that all prisoners were to be executed. He gave the orders for that, but his commanders would not carry that out. Mm -hmm. Because they had a lot of German prisoners over here, too. Sure. And what, what happened to the American people if that happened, they probably <coughs> stormed the camps like Fort Niagara and Camp Perry and mm -hmm. drag all those prisoners out and execute them. So what was it like when you were liberated? Did the tanks just come rolling <coughs> up to the gates? Or? Yeah. yeah, they the came through. Yeah, there, the there's water, water there. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, the see the tanks. And uh, I walked around with, this time we could walk around the camp because there were no guards anymore. And I walked to a fence and there was a big hole in the fence where somebody had crawled through the fence. So I went through the hole and I went out on the road <coughs> and I walked down the road. What a feeling. Unbelievable. You don't realize how much you don't, you don't have freedom until you lose it. Mm -hmm. And I walked down and what a sense of relief to look around and nobody pointing guns at me and rifles and, and uh, you know, glaring at me. And I walked into a town, uh, but there was really nothing there, uh, no food or anything. And I walked back out and went back to the camp. I thought, what am I doing in the middle of Germany here, down in Bavaria? I can't get out of here. No sense escaping. I'm already free. So I went back to camp and waited. And we were there for a month, a week or two, and they brought food in them. Sea rations and things, and oh boy, <laughs> a piece of bread was like cake today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, didn't give us much, but uh, they had a lot of people. And uh, that took us to a airfield uh, where they had these C 47s come in mm -hmm. and pick us up. And uh, we were waiting there <clears throat> in what had formerly been uh, barracks, which mm -hmm. nice for the German youth guards that they were training. Oh. They, of course, were gone. And I went out on the field, and uh, this one evening, late in the evening, a flock of German biplanes came in. They were training planes that had come from some training base, escaping the Russians. The Russians were coming in, so they were escaping them. Now, was the war still on, or had the war ended? The war ended. The okay. war was over, and we were liberated. Okay. They were just waiting. So they came in, and they taxied at the end of the field, and there was a German, a big Russian contingent. Uh, prisoner uh, uh, on the camp over near the side of the, the area. And they all came out and they grabbed these German flyers and never saw them again. I don't know what they did, but uh, they had a tremendous hatred mm -hmm. for the Germans for what happened in Russia. And uh, <clears throat> so then finally we got on a plane and it was a. Uh, like they had a lot of people on the plane, but ours was they had a couple of big tires, aircraft wheels in there. So they only took five of us. Five prisoners as passengers. And we were going to Camp Lucky Strike in France. <clears throat> but we stopped on the way at some airport, airfield, to unload these uh, supplies, aircraft supplies. <clears throat> and of course we ran for the mess hall. <laughs> and we just ate and ate. Big mistake. I spent the night cramped up, pain, throwing up, <coughs> Something wouldn't take. Yeah. But when you 
put a big plate of food in front of the starving man, what's he going to do? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so we were all in that spot. So then we got back on the plane again and flew into Camp Lahar, Camp Lucky Spring, Lahar. And then the, uh, did they give you a thorough medical <laughs> examination yeah. or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's all over. Okay, did you, at that point, did you uh, see anyone that you knew from? Oh, well, I met a guy in Camp Wexler. Uh, name was uh, Silvio Dan. <coughs> we knew each other. We were in the same classes together in high school. Mm -hmm. And he was in Civil Air Patrol along with me, but he left at a different time than I did with a different group. And he ended up as a tail gunner on a B-24 in Italy. And he got shot down on a mission out of Italy and he ended up in Wetzler, and I was in the camp one morning, and we would fall out every morning, and have a roll call to make sure that we were there. <coughs> and I heard somebody yell out, door, door. I thought, what's this? Who knows me here? And it was so good. Hmm. So we were together until the end then. Yeah. All right, so. And he saved my life, because I, I got into prison camp then, and I, I couldn't hardly navigate. You know, I still had all the effects of uh, uh, my wounds and everything, and mm -hmm. he would bring food to me, what little we could get, but he would bring that to me to help me, and, and if it wasn't for him, I probably not would have made it. So, I had a lot of help. And uh, how long were you at Lucky Strike or Lahar before they, they shipped yeah, you home? A couple of weeks, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And they fed us a certain amount, five times a day, a little bit, five times a day, and a lot of things like uh, eggnog. Mm -hmm. Things like that, you know, high protein things, and uh, but just balanced so that you didn't get enough to hurt you, mm -hmm. but enough that to be able. To, they wanted to fatten us up a little bit before they sent us back to the stage. We were pretty gaunt, looked like scarecrows. And so they put you on the ship and, and sent you home. Yeah, I got on the ship, uh, and right away I got. I was suspended cheap. They put me in sick bay, mm -hmm. and I spent it was ten days coming back. I spent most of the time in sick bay. I could go out on the deck and walk around a little bit. But, uh, okay. Once you got back to the States, did they send you home or did you go back well, to the hospital? Well, no, they, we went into Boston. We were supposed to go into New York Harbor, but for some reason they diverted us to Boston to uh, Camp Miles Standish. Mm -hmm. And we stayed there for about a week. And uh, till they, they brought us then by train into Fort Dix. And we stayed at Fort Dix for a couple of weeks. No phone calls. You couldn't get near a phone. Mm -hmm. There still wasn't anything. And <clears throat> came back uh, by train then. Now, did they discharge you at that point? No. no. Okay. Uh, they sent me back home, and I got into Buffalo. And I thought, boy, my family doesn't even know I'm alive. And I know my mother would have taken it very, very strong. So uh, I called on the phone, and uh, oh, it's her just hardly be able to talk, you know. We didn't even have a phone at home. So, you know, this is back in the 40s wartime. Yeah. And the neighbor, I called the neighbors, and they got my mother over and said, talk to her. She said, oh, come on home, come on home, right away. So I came home, I stopped at the town, I had a car while I was in, at home. Uh, and uh, my brother got it during the war. And uh, he had a job up in Tonawanda in a shoe store part time. <clears throat> so I stopped there, I got off the bus, and I stopped mm -hmm. there, and. I still remember he was downstairs picking some boxes of shoes. He came up, <laughs> he looked at me when he walked up, and he almost fell over. Hmm. And uh, so then they, they came home with him. And I think the first time in my life I ever saw my mother break down and cry. I walked up to the house, she her arms around me. She just sobbed and sobbed. And, and it was a very tough time for her and the family. The whole family. <laughs> now, they knew that you were shot down. Yeah, they knew I was shot down. But they didn't know if you were alive or dead? <clears throat> no. Okay. Was your father still alive? Yeah, he was alive. Okay. And uh, how long were you home for? Uh, I think we had a 30-day furlough and then went to Atlantic City for the assignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that's when they told me that I had passed everything, I could go to flying school or wherever. So then they sent me up to Madison, Wisconsin uh, to go to uh, radio school. Because I always thought the, the radio guy had a pretty nice job there, you know. 
So, so you, uh, at that point, decided that maybe you were going to make the uh, Air Force a career? Not really, but I couldn't get out. Uh, they, they went by the point system. Even though you were a POW for all yeah. that? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they sent me up there, <clears throat> and then I stayed there for a couple of weeks. They said, well, you got too many points to go through radio school because you'll be up for discharge long before you get out of school. Mm -hmm. And if you want to stay in, you can stay in, and uh, you have to sign up. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. So they said, well, what else do I want to do? I, I didn't know anything. Just get me out of here. So they said, well, how'd you like to be an officer? Could have been. And uh, I said, well, that'd be fine. They said, we'll send you to OCS. I didn't come out of second lieutenant in four months. So they got me all signed up for officer school, so we'll see us. And then when they were signing the final papers, they said, you know, you have to stay in for a couple of years after your commission. Wait a minute, you didn't tell me that. Mm -hmm. I said, no way, no, I won't. And he got mad. And he says, oh, I said, with all this work to get you into the school, you're qualified, everything is fine. I said, no, I turned down flying school because I didn't want to stay in for that level of time. Uh, the military, I enjoyed the military while I was in, but I didn't want to make a career out of it. Okay, I'm going to stop now. i got to change the tape. Now, you were saying that uh, you decided uh, you weren't going to be an officer because you didn't want to sign up for the extra time. So what, what happened at that point? Well, then uh, I said, get me as close to home as you can. And I'll just wait up my time. So they sent me to Syracuse, mm -hmm. Army Air Force Base then, which had just about closed down. It was a big training base during the war, but that wasn't a training base anymore, and they were just shutting down, but it was still active. And they made me sergeant of the guard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a jeep every morning, or a command car, or whatever I wanted. Uh -huh. Out of the motor pool, turn it in, get another one. Uh, eat well, uh, class A passed the town every night if I wanted to. All I did all day was just ride around the base and check in at the guard post, how's everything going, you need anything, uh -huh. you know, just wasting my time. Well, that, <clears throat> there I got sick again. They said I had diphtheria, uh -huh. part of the after effects again of the war. And uh, they sent me to Rome, um, the Air Force Base. I was there for about three weeks, uh, recuperating from this diphtheria. And they said I had it, so mm -hmm. I didn't know how. But I was home on leave. Uh, I came over every week on train, and <clears throat> when I came back, I oh, flushed and uh, sore throat and really felt lousy. <coughs> Went to the sick bay the next morning, and they threw me right into the hospital, checked me out, and on the way to the hospital from Circus to Rome, put in an ambulance, put a mask over my face, and uh, <coughs> rushed me to the hospital. Mm. Put me in isolation for a couple of weeks. And, and I got recovered enough from that, and they sent me home to discharge. They discharged you. Okay, once you were discharged, <coughs> did uh, you make use of the GI Bill? Oh, yeah. Well, I tried to get a job, and all the veterans were returning, people that had families, that there were no jobs. Uh, even though I was a welder, all of the industry was shut down, and tooling and everything for civilian use. So, <coughs> uh, I was coming around with a lot of my friends that had also come back, and we were going on this side of, well, let's go up and see what we can get in school. So the four of us went up to UB and uh, went through to all the exams and everything. I was the only guy that passed them all. And uh, so they said, well, let's set you to get on the GA bill and go to college. And uh, my folks said, well, you know, stay here, you know, room and board, no room and board, no nothing. He said, uh, no. <coughs> and they made us something like, to fifty dollars a month, which is a lot of money then. Yeah. Now there was also what they called the fifty two twenty club. Yeah, I got into that. Okay. Yep. All right, so you uh, went to college? Yeah. And I, I graduated after four years with a four year Bachelor of Science degree with a major in uh, accounting, mm -hmm. minor in economics. <coughs> and I ended up with my life as an accountant. From welding to accounting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I took a commercial course in high school. Uh -huh. And uh, so I was kind of a natural for that. I, I, in a way, I'm sorry I didn't continue on to law school. I, I could have. Uh, 
put up. But I, at that time, I just had enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was still suffering from this uh, memories of the war and all that, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that contributed to it because I. I'm sorry, now I could have gone to law school, went to law school, I could have been in law, but I wish I had done that. Uh -huh. But I did well anyway. I did okay. I had a good job all the time. I was a oh, good accounting job. Okay. Did you think? <clears throat> gave a supervisor. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Oh, yeah. Uh, I joined the uh, Civil Air Patrol. And I became a <clears throat> very active member of that for 30 years. And I flew as a, uh, I couldn't fly as a, a pilot anymore because I, I couldn't pass the medical. Mm -hmm. But I flew as an observer and I flew as co-pilot, uh, navigator, learned all that over 30 years, took a lot of Air Force courses, and ended up working through the ranks, second lieutenant, and all the way up. And after 27 years, I became lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. in the Civil Air Patrol. And I enjoyed that, working with the cadets and the programs and going on missions and uh, search and rescue missions with the Water Tom to rescue searches and the floods in uh, Oklahoma for a week. Mm -hmm. Flew like missions out of there. And a lot of exciting times. Mm -hmm. Helicopter rides, flying bombers, cargoes. <coughs> did you uh, did you ever find out what happened to the rest of your crew? Yeah, uh, they all came back. Uh, well, on the plane that I went down with, uh, two guys were killed. Tail gunner and the, well, and the uh, flight engineer were killed, but that was not my crew. Did did they uh, make it out of the plane or? Yeah, they got out of the plane. Okay, and they either died in captivity or. Well, they got probably got through on the ground. Yeah. Because uh, the German the, the civilians, even though it was Belgium, you know, there were a lot of Germans around, and uh, they probably got caught by them and someone just blasted them. Mm -hmm. so, I was lucky. Now, your original crew, the group that you normally would have flown with, did they all make it back? Yeah, all of them. It was just the luck of the draw, unfortunately, where they grabbed you. I was flying with another crew. Yeah. As a replacement for some guy that wouldn't fly anymore. Mm -hmm. On the day that I was, see, my rank carried a staff sergeant, which I didn't get to. I was up for it, but mm -hmm. uh, ready for it, <clears throat> but didn't get promoted to that yet. But then the uh, Todd Lyric was also a, a tech sergeant, uh -huh. so that was uh, another straight. And I thought, well, as long as I'm here, and I'd like that spot up there, and I thought it'd be interesting and a little exciting, so I, I went for it. I never, of course, got that far. Mm -hmm. Now, they obviously, they all must have been surprised when they, they found out that you were still alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the whole family. Um, a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins. Uh -huh. and, <coughs> yeah. Now, did you join any veterans organizations? Oh, yeah, the uh, uh, American Legion, uh, the Air Force Historical Society. Uh, that's about mostly for the veterans. Okay. Uh, have you attended any reunions at all? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Uh, every year, the 8th Air Force, I didn't know about the Bob Loop having this uh, programs until uh, well after I was out of college or reading mm -hmm. an article in the newspaper. Oh, wow, the Air Force, you know, the 303rd Bob Loop uh, asking for members, contacted members. So I uh, sent them a letter saying I was a member of the 8th Air Force squadron and Bob Loop. And they sent me letters back with applications and everything, and so I joined. And, uh, then we went <coughs> to uh, oh, quite a few. We went to Savannah, Georgia, three times. That's where the Eighth Air Force has their national headquarters, and that mm -hmm. big museum there, Eighth Air Force Museum there. Went to uh, San Francisco to a big one there, another one to Colorado Springs. Each one of these lasted over a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Or what I said, I can't even remember. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and then they disbanded about three years ago. Everybody's up in years, they didn't sure. have any people left. And <clears throat> but now this, oh, what is this? August, the 8th Air Force is having a big reunion of all 8th Air Force members, uh, even though their headquarters is in 
Savannah, Georgia, which I loved it down there. Mm -hmm. And anyway, they had this big reunion in Cincinnati. And I saw in the literature that they sent me on it that the 303rd Bond Group is asking for your members to contact them, and they will all get together and have mm -hmm. uh, get together for that. So my wife and I are hoping that we could do it. Have you stayed in contact with any of the guys you've served with? We did originally, you know, for the first number of years, but gradually that kind of dropped by the wayside as mm -hmm. we went our separate ways. And at the reunions, I saw a pilot, uh, spent one week with him, a co-pilot. He stayed in the service. And he ended up uh, air attaché in Argentina, and he spent a lot of time in Germany. Uh, he ended up as a colonel. And uh, then I saw the navigator, and uh, he passed away since most of them are gone. Mm -hmm. And I never, uh, the con pilot came to see me after I got home. Uh -huh. uh, he with his wife went to Niagara Falls, and then they stopped on the way. And I had a date with a girl that night for, went to the show in Kahnawaga, <coughs> and he stopped at my parents' house, and they told him that I had been out, and I was, uh, I probably had to start theater. So he came up to the theater with his uh, friends that he was all with, and he went up and down the aisles, up and down the aisles, until he saw me. And he out we went, and boy, that was a nice little reunion. Uh -huh. and then we went out for, uh, for dinner, and uh, kind of went over the whole story. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you probably uh, answered this question, but uh, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Oh, considerably. I think I finally grew up for one thing. Because I was just a kid when I went in, you know, just floating. And uh, I think it gave me purpose, and, uh, uh, gave me direction. Uh, and it gave me a real appreciation of other people. Because mm -hmm. I, I realized what a lot of people had gone through uh, besides me. And, the horrors of war, what I saw in Germany, I, I never forgot. I thought war is hell, you know, mm -hmm. it's just not affecting us. And I think, quite go to any extreme possible uh, to stay out of a war. But once you're in it, go all the way. And that's why things like uh, Iraq, you know, where we go in, we're not really doing anything. <coughs> that doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Same with Korea, stopping the 38th parallel. That's the way to fight a war. So stay out of it until you're actually hurting yourself, or they're putting the bombs on you and then go in and blast them. Mm -hmm. You know, none of this little piecemeal stuff like we've got now. That doesn't do anything. You've got all these people that are dead, trillions of dollars spent for what? Mm -hmm. For nothing. Do you think uh, you would have gone on to college if it hadn't have been for the GI Bill? I don't know. Probably not. Because mm -hmm. I uh, came from a middle class family and. Uh, uh, not taking a college entrance course, although I took a commercial course, but I probably would have got a job uh, in some other field and maybe not going to college. Mm -hmm. Probably not. So that was a big thing. The government, I'd say, took really good care of us veterans coming back. I got a college degree out of it, like millions of others did. Uh, they got a lot of medical attention from the VA. Uh, <clears throat> so they, they did well. Mm -hmm. They did well. They had programs. In fact, this Thursday I'm going to a, a POW recognition uh, meeting uh, day at the uh, Veterans Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did a lot of demo work for me and a lot of work for my heart. Mm -hmm. and, uh, took good care of us. No complaints whatsoever. And I talked to people that had returned to service from England. <coughs> and in England and they came back, they didn't have nothing. Mm -hmm. They didn't get any money, they didn't get any attention, and just like kept floating around. And of course the guys that went back to Germany, the prisoners, anybody, they, they got nothing. So this country took care of us, really mm -hmm. good. But for a lot of years we didn't have access to any of this stuff. Like I found that I could have been, <coughs> received a promotion in my records up to tech sergeant. I didn't know that. I didn't know that I was eligible for any benefits from the VA uh, until the 50s, the mm -hmm. 60s. Didn't know that it was, in fact, even the 70s and 80s before I really got any attention. I didn't know, they just didn't advertise this stuff. Mm -hmm. But still, it was there, and uh, 
people that really needed it, they got it. And now it, they're just so overwhelmed that they're over, they, they're understaffed, don't have enough hospitals. Uh, you go up to the uh, Veterans Hospital in Buffalo here, <coughs> you can hardly find a place to park. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's tough, but still, they call me. Uh, I go up for a fluid and test every month uh, for blood thinners and uh, to get dental work. Uh, things like, you know, they, they take care of you. They, mm -hmm. they watch out for you or they call you up and see how, how you're doing and uh, go in a couple of times a year for a checkup and uh, it's all automatic. So they take good care of you. Got no complaints whatsoever about the treatment. Now there's a lot of people, veterans that are on waiting lists to even get medical attention or to get even classified. It's just because they're so overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. they, they, they take as many as they can for the people that they've got, but it's going to take time to filter through all these things. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Well, I'm glad to do it.